<laughs> technology. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Glenis Heap, and I'm, um, w I work within the training department. My official title is Director of CPD, Continuing Professional Development Programs. Um, we've got quite a large audience uh, this evening, and uh, when I was looking through the, the list, we seem to have uh, a number of people from outside the UK as well. So um, for those of you outside the UK, you can practice putting things in the question box. Can you just type in, if you're in a country outside of the UK, can you just type in which country you're actually listening from? It would be quite interesting, I think, for us all to, uh, to see that. Uh, the other thing I need to say to you before we start is that um, at some point within the presentation, you will need to have a, a paper and pen to hand or paper and pencil to hand. Um, so if you can um, get uh, get hold of that. Um, I also need to apologize. I've got a stupid tickly cough, and so I'll have to keep clearing my throat and uh, having sips of water from time to time. So I hope that won't uh, uh, spoil it too much. Um, we've got Christine from Gibraltar. And we've got Jennifer from Qatar. I don't know whether I'm, sound, I'm actually pronouncing that um, uh, correctly. But um, yeah, people from all over the world, which is uh, amazing, isn't it? OK, well, this evening's presentation, um, what we're going to do is to sort of look at um, going to go back to the rose definition and um, hopefully for those of you um, gosh we've got somebody from Texas as well and Slovakia gosh okay um, those of you who, who don't know a couple of years ago uh, the government commissioned a report uh, from Sir Jim Rose um, about dyslexia uh, and the kind of um, uh, work that was being done in schools and the report was, was produced and a definition uh, came out of that that was actually agreed by all of the different dyslexia uh, organizations. And so we're going to go back to that within the presentation um, because I think you know that will sort of set the scene uh, for when we talk about dyslexia and the sort of co-occurring difficulties um, that come around that. Now we've got an hour and an hour is not a great deal of time, as I'm sure you're going to find out. So within that hour, I'm obviously not going to be able to cover any particular area in, in depth. But I, what I hope to get across is the, um, the, the thoughts around co-occurring difficulties, or comorbidity is another name for it, that actually um, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, all of these things that we talk about actually um, can co-occur. They overlap. And so, really, in a way, um, it's difficult now for us to talk just about dyslexia or just about dyspraxia, etc. So, what I'm hoping to do this, this evening is to go through that and for you to get an idea um, around those different difficulties um, that can occur alongside the dyslexia. Sorry, Glennis, can I just interrupt so, before you go? Just think Sorry. Sorry, Glennis, it's yeah. Cherry. Can we just we yeah. just got a few people saying that your um, audio keeps slipping in and out. It's just very slightly. Could you maybe try moving your microphone a little bit? Let's see if that you just is that any better? Um a little bit a little bit more. Try moving a little bit more. Um, okay. And is that any wor any better? Or oh, is that worse? Seems okay to me. Let's yeah, a bit better now. Everybody's okay, saying so. Okay. <laughs> gosh, we've Sorry. got someone from Bulgaria as well that's popped up. So gosh, okay. Right now then, let's have a look at a few of the messages um, that we've been getting uh, around dyslexia. I think we can say that dyslexia is now um, far better understood than it was even ten years ago, and we really have much more of an idea about. Um, what we should be doing, especially around um, reading. And those messages are now getting out into schools uh, and colleges. But one of the things that we need to think more about are uh, the other specific learning difficulties. Um, and also to think about those children, the young people that we're working with, who don't respond well to what we might determine as being best practice methods. So we need to think about the other problems that people can have alongside dyslexia. <coughs> this is the um, report that I was talking about, the, um, the Rose Review that was published in June 2000. 
2009 about identifying and teaching children and young people with dyslexia and literacy difficulties. The key points that came out of the ROSE review, the ROSE report, are that all teachers have a responsibility to help to identify children with specific learning difficulties and to adapt their teaching methods to enable them to be fully included. It's not just the English teachers, it's not just the special needs teachers, all teachers have that responsibility. And so we need to have inclusion. But there will always be children who actually need more individualized interventions, uh, need specialist literacy intervention. And so those programs need to run alongside. So we need inclusion and we need individualized um, intervention programs. The report was accepted by the government. All the recommendations, the content of the report was accepted. Uh, and funding was, um, was put forward to actually implement the recommendations. Uh, and that amounted to about £10 million over two years. The aim was to actually train around 4,000 specialist teachers. Uh, well, we in Dyslexia Action have done our best, and we have trained several hundred teachers over the last few years. Um, I don't think that the 4,000 target is going to be met, um, but we're certainly going a long way towards it. <coughs> now, let's have a look at the definition that came from uh, the Rose Report. Dyslexia is a learning difficulty that primarily affects the skills involved in accurate and fluent word reading and spelling. It affects the skills. Okay. And the characteristic features of dyslexia are difficulties in phonological awareness, verbal memory, and verbal processing speed. So it's not just about reading difficulties, it's about the skills that we need to actually um, read and spell. It also says that dyslexia occurs across the range of intellectual abilities and it's best thought of as a continuum. If you think about it being um, sort of a line with very severe at one end and very mildly affected at the other end, so it's a continuum. And they say that it's not a distinct category. There are no clear cutoff points. So this is looking at it in a sort of a more dimensional rather than a categorical uh, point of view. Um, I suppose in a way, it, it's like when we talk about blood pressure, it's an arbitrary point. What might be considered high for one person um, it is not for another. So <clears throat> the characteristic features of dyslexia we know to be phonological awareness, which is about um, looking, reflecting on the units of sounds within words. It's about verbal memory, that's being able to retain spoken information within the short-term working memory systems. And it's about the processing speed. Um, it's about how you take on board information um, and access spoken information from long-term memory. So how quickly you can do that, take on board information, process it, pull information back from long-term memory. If you have difficulties in these particular areas, then that's reflecting that sort of core weakness in the systems. And so difficulties in these areas affect the development of decoding, um, reading and encoding spelling, in reading and spelling skills there. So we're looking at a language-based difficulty that affects words, sounds, and memory. So from our point of view, the phonological theory wins. Yay, okay. But the definition also says that there may be co-occurring difficulties. They may be seen in aspects of language, motor coordination, mental calculation, concentration and attention, and personal organization. But it says these are not by themselves markers of dyslexia. They occur alongside. They co-occur alongside dyslexia. And uh, it ends the definition by saying, a good indication of the severity and persistence of dyslexia 
dyslexic difficulties can be gained by examining how the individual responds or has responded to well-founded intervention. Okay, so, question for you. What do we mean by well-founded intervention? What do you think we mean by well-founded intervention? What would that include? Can you pop those some answers into your question box for me? Okay, getting some answers in here. Multisensory intervention. Hickey dip, <laughs> dilp, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the dilp process. Specialized teaching, good letters and sounds teaching. Cumulative structured, specialized teaching. Wow, they're flooding in. <laughs> phonics, alpha to omega. Good early teaching of phonics. We're all in agreement here. Phonological <laughs> theory wins. ALK, units of sound, more input than an average child needs, memory training, okay, uh, speaking, listening skills, lots and lots of suggestions there, well done, thank you, they're still coming in, um, personalized, overlearning, yeah, okay, great. Now, I've put together just a few of the things that... Um, that I thought about well-founded intervention, uh, and you've already answered a lot of these. Multisensory, yeah, absolutely. We all know that when you're planning anything, you need to think, what does the child need to see, what do they need to hear, and what do they need to be able to do? Um, it has to be multisensory, and there are lots and lots of different ways we can introduce information, we can get reporting back from the children, lots of different ways. Use all the senses. And yes, it should be systematic and structured, one thing building upon another with lots and lots of repetition and rehearsal. It should be little and often. We need to build in rehearsal, repetition, time and time again using reading cards, um, uh, revision cards, anything like that, um, and teaching. It is probably better to do a little bit each day than to have one block uh, on a Thursday afternoon or whatever. Um, and yes, it needs to be delivered by trained and supported staff. And I think that supported bit is very important. Um, as specialist teachers, we've all been in situations where we go into a school or into a classroom and we do our bit um, and the teacher just sort of tolerates us being there um, but really we need the support of all the staff they need to know what it is we're doing so that they can continue the good work in their lessons as well and that support has to be valued by everybody you shouldn't be there on your own as that SEN person that comes in and it has to be evidence-based <clears throat> We need to know um, what their previous rate of progress was. You know, how, how were they learning that? How are we going to assess that? We need to know that they are responding. We also need to know how do other pupils respond to that intervention and be able to compare them. So those are just a few of the, of the things that I put together, um, and you've got lots more there as well. Early identification, over-learning, personalized learning, appropriate to each child. All of these great answers. Thank you. So, as we've said, as we've seen in the, uh, in the definition, it is about phonology, but it's not only about phonology, because there are other difficulties other specific learning difficulties that will co-occur. So we need to be mindful of those. In fact, the research, I'm going to show a little bit of that in a moment, the research is that it's the norm rather than the exception that there will be co-occurring difficulties. So other specific learning difficulties, other reading difficulties, and there will also be consequential difficulties. Um, the book here um, is Developmental Disorders of Language Learning and Cognition by um, Charles Hume and Maggie Snowling, um, who are um, 
have got a huge amount of experience in the research field around dyslexia and about reading difficulties. Um, and in this book, which was published last year, um, they say, they talk about comorbidity or, or co-occurrence. Comorbidity is defined as the co-occurrence of two different disorders or diseases in the same individual. And they go on to say, <clears throat> there is no doubt that comorbidity between seemingly related disorders is rife. For example, children with mathematics disorder are likely to also have reading disorders. Children with specific language impairment are also likely to have developmental coordination disorders, and children with ADHD are likely to have a range of other disorders, including reading disorders. This is what the research is telling us. Now, if we have a look at this, this is a very neat diagram, um, too neat probably, um, but it just sort of gives you that, uh, that view of what we mean by these different difficulties um, actually uh, sort of overlapping. Um, and someone's just asked me, uh, likely more than 50%. I'm going to look at the percentages in a moment. Okay, so we have... Um, attention deficit disorder um, that's looking at attention, concentration, planning, regulating. We have dyspraxia or developmental coordination disorder, which is about spatial awareness, motor skills and coordination. We've got autistic spectrum disorders around social con uh, significance. Um, and we've got dyslexia with the words, sounds, memory and sequencing. Um, We've also got uh, dyscalculia and mass learning difficulty, and I'm going to touch on, uh, on these different aspects um, in a little while. But if we look at these sort of percentages, the prevalence um, within the UK population, and obviously this varies according to the different diagnostic criteria applied, um, but really we're looking at um, around 5% um, with um, ADHD. Uh, but there are many undiagnosed within the UK. And one of the facts that I found was that um, in 1994, medication was prescribed for 6,000 youngsters. But in 2003, it had gone up to 345,000. Okay. Um, dyslexia. We think it's about 10% of the population um, are dyslexic to some degree. Remember that continuum. Uh, for dyspraxia, about 3 to 6% of the population. Um, for autistic spectrum disorders, it's around, um, around 1%. Um, for dyscalculia, again, about 3 to 6%. Uh, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, and for um, speech language, um, speech language impairment, um, it's about 50% um, of those will go on to experience reading difficulties. Okay. So, <clears throat> if we um, move on to, as I said before, the other one was a, a very sort of neat picture, um, but this is just a, a slide showing that really um, some research that Dr. John Rapp published um, a couple of years ago um, shows that around 63% um, of people who have, uh, who have been assessed as being dyslexic also have a dyspraxic difficulty as well. Um, and I think that's, that's just huge, isn't it? 63%. Um, this is um, some work that I put in that was uh, written by um, um, a boy age nine, um, a really bright boy. He was actually diagnosed at the age of five years with dyspraxia. But the school didn't recognize his dyslexic difficulties until he was around nine. So if we look at the letter formation, and the spatial difficulties due to his dyspraxia, and the spelling and lack of punctuation due to dyslexia, you can see the kind of difficulties. Um, and it's actually you know, looking at those difficulties and realizing that it's not just dyslexia or just dyspraxia, but actually these difficulties can co-occur. So we need to look at the child's difficulties, not just at the labels. 
Um, from some research um, that uh, Madeleine Portwood reported um, that, that Dewey had done in the year 2000, um, looking at developmental coordination disorder or dyspraxia, that we can see that there is this sort of co-occurrence with all these different um, specific learning difficulties, um, that about 82% of people who were assessed as being dyspraxic also had another comorbid disorder. These are some statistics from colleagues um, from ICANN about speech, language and communication needs. That in some parts of the UK, about 50% um, of children are starting school with speech, language and communication needs. And they estimate that about 10% of all children have complex or persistent speech, language, communication needs. And that 10% is made up um, of um, children who have got that sort of co-occurring type of difficulty uh, of autism, hearing impairment, um, but 77% have speech, language, communication as their main or primary difficulty. Right. As I was reading through the research um, in preparation uh, for this webinar, um, the research was telling me that um, the developmental disorders show that working memory problems are a central concept for um, ADHD, dyslexia, and um, DCD dyspraxia. So I thought, really, let's sort of just spend a few moments looking at that sort of working memory um, system, about the information processing system. Excuse me, quick sip of water. Um, that we talk about short-term memory, we talk about working memory. Well, we're sort of here really about the, the same sort of thing. Um, and for, for people who have the kind of difficulties that we're talking around about ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and so on, um, then we're looking at problems with communication in some way, with processing information. And so we're going to think about um, our long-term memory as a, as a filing cabinet and our short-term working memory as a shelf. Um, and information comes onto that shelf. Um, so we get visual spatial information, verbal information, um, short-term memory, um, all goes onto that, onto that shelf. Um, and there may be problems around auditory or visual discrimination to begin with, that they can't actually um, perceive the difference between similar sounds, um, that there's nothing physically wrong with their hearing, although we should obviously always have that checked, uh, but that the brain can't actually determine the difference between those sounds. Um, or from visual discrimination, uh, people, when I mention dyslexia, lots of people say to me, oh yes, that's when they get B's and D's mixed up, isn't it? Well, yeah, lots of children do get B's and D's mixed up right up until the age of nine. Um, but other people who, who have dyslexic type difficulties, yes, they do. They confuse similar shapes. It's shapes that can be flipped over or turned around, so like B's and D's or N's and U's and M's and W's. Um, also sort of the um, math symbols as well as sometimes musical notation. So there can be visual discrimination um, difficulties as well. So um, the information that sits on that shelf may be wrong uh, already. It may be um, the capacity. How big is your shelf? How much information can you hold in short-term memory, individual um, pieces of information? Um, we haven't got time to do it today, but I often do a, an exercise um, where I give people a, a series of numbers uh, that they have to um, hold on to uh, and then repeat back to me. Um, and for many of us, we can do around seven pieces of information that we can hold onto that shelf before we have to do something with it, either we chunk it or um, we keep it repeating it or we write it down or we do something. Um, but for people with these kind of working memory difficulties, it might only be two or three pieces of information before it falls off their shelf. And if that's auditory information, once it's gone, it's gone. If it's visual information, you stand a better chance because you can sort of go back round the loop again and pick it up. Um, but auditory information, 
um, can, can just disappear. Also, um, the uh, speed of information processing is important. You know, we need to be able to process information very quickly. Um, it has a very short shelf life. We can only hold information up to about 30 seconds before we need to do something with it. We either um, uh, you know, put a strategy in place, repetition, rehearsal, going over it and over it, we chunk it, um, we sort of link it to, to meaning, um, we do all sorts of things to actually remember and we have to do all that very, very quickly. Okay. Um, because otherwise it falls off the shelf um, and it's lost again. Okay. And the other thing that happens within working memory is that ability to, um, to uh, juggle information. Okay, um, to be able to take information on, to be able to do something with it, to listen to information, to pull back information from long-term memory, um, to remember what someone said, to remember something else, and, and actually to process all of this. Um, and it's basically, it's a juggling act. Okay. Um, I mean, if I gave you um, a sum to do, if I said to you, what's 34 times 58? Can you do that in your head? Just take a moment, um, if you can't do it, but to think about the processes that you would need to do. How would you actually tackle that without writing it down? How would you tackle 34 times 58? Just think about that for a moment. Okay. So maybe you're trying to juggle all the information. You, know, you might approach it in different ways. Okay? People might visualize it. Okay? You might actually you know, round it up and make that easier to do. But what you're doing is juggling with information. The answer is 1,972, by the way, okay? for those of you like me who would have been struggling with that. Mm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> storing information in long-term memory. It's about getting information into our sort of long-term memory storage, into our filing cabinet, if you like, and being able to pull it back when we need it. Now, to be able to find it again, you have to actually store it um, effectively, efficiently. Um, and meaning is probably the most effective way of, of transferring information, to link it to something that you already know, to add it to something that you've already got stored in there. Um, one of the boys I worked with a few years ago, when he came to me, he got huge difficulties, dyspraxia as well as dyslexia, um, and, and really, um, well, he hated anything to do with reading and writing, to be quite honest, um, but we had to find a way forward, and um, that was he find that he told me that he was absolutely fascinated by dinosaurs and fossils, as a lot of young boys that age um, are. Um, and so um, you can't believe the number of worksheets and things I put together around dinosaurs and fossils. But it helped because it captures his in, captured his interest. Uh, and in a way, um, John actually kept the information about dinosaurs and fossils in the top drawer in the first file in his filing cabinet. And so he'd already got a lot of background information there, um, and new information then could slot in relatively easily. Because he was interested, he was happy about that kind of information, the process worked very well. But it was as if, if it wasn't capturing his interest, if it was something that perhaps he'd tried to do before and failed, so it was that sort of negative uh, feeling about it. In a way, it was as if he just opened any one of those drawers and sort of lobbed that information in. Um, so some of it might be there, but you might have already lost some of that information from that shelf. So because it wasn't stored eff effectively, finding it again and pulling it back could be really tricky for him. So all of these things, manipulating information, processing speed, how much you can hold, um, it has an impact on lots of different things, and one of the main things that working memory has an impact on is around sequencing, about sequencing information, uh, being able to juggle it, put it in order. And if you think about, we think about sequences as being sort of, um, you know, the alphabet, months of the year, etc., etc. Um, but also, if you think about it, reading and spelling 
our sequencing information. Um, organizing is about sequencing. It's about saying, what have I got to do? How am I going to do it? What order am I going to do it in? So all of these things are affected by working memory. And as we've said, a lot of the specific learning difficulties that we're considering are affected by working memory. Okay. So, I'm sorry, you, lots of you are writing in questions, and we'll, we'll try and get to some of them later if we have time. Otherwise, we'll try and answer them uh, by email. But I've got such a lot to get through that um, I can't keep stopping and, and answering questions, so I apologize for that. But um, we'll do our best. So, if we think about aspects of, of language, of speaking and listening, um, that we communicate, we ask questions, we answer questions, we have to translate language into thought and then thought into language. So if we consider the sort of the process there um, and bearing in mind the difficulties we've talked about around working memory, um, then we can soon see that there could be issues around speech and language. So the question passes from the ear to the brain and that comes into us as a string of sounds. And so then we have to um, filter that string of sound to remove um, extraneous background noise and filters and so on. Um, and by the way, background noise within the classroom can have an effect on things falling off your short-term memory, etc. Okay. Um, and then we convert that, that string um, into a chain of words. So we refer back to the knowledge of the vocabulary that we've got stored in long-term memory. Um, we then have to, uh, once the words are identified, we have to convert them from sounds into concepts, understanding, and knowledge. Um, we have to do a sort of a, a grammar analysis when the meaning of each word or chunk of words is clear. Then we relate, the, we um, examine the relationships, we analyze the relationships between them. And then finally, and all this happens in milliseconds, the listener can understand the question, they then have to formulate the answer, pulling back the information to make sure it's grammatically correct, and verbalize it. Just think of the load on working memory there. Okay. Right, another little task for you to do. If you're listening with someone else in the room, then uh, you can turn to your neighbor. <laughs> and you can talk to them. If you're listening by yourself, then maybe you'll just have to say it out loud. It's okay, you're all muted, so nobody's going to hear you. But what I want you to do, I'm going to give you one minute, and what I want you to do is to tell your neighbor, or say it out loud, what you had for dinner last night, but you must not use any words that contain the letter E. Okay? What you had for dinner last night, but you must not use any words that contain the letter E. Okay, one minute, off you go. Okay, how did you find that? 
Um, I'm sure you found it a bit of a, a juggling task there to actually think of a word but then think, no, no, that's not right. I have to use find a different word. Um, and a lot of our learners actually um, find that when they want to write and they can't find, they can't spell the word they want so they have to find another word. Or they can't quite find the word they want to say so they have to look around for another word. So within all of these um, sort of overlapping difficulties, um, we have to think, you know, where do we talk about poor comprehenders? Where do they fit? Or where do the children with maths learning difficulties fit? Do they fit in ADHD or dyspraxia or dyslexia? Where do they fit? Okay. Well, this just shows the difficulty with labels, actually. Um, and we shouldn't let labels stand in the way. Yes, they are important for lots of different reasons. But we should be thinking of the individual child and the individual child needs. Let's not rely too much um, on the labels. If we think a little bit about um, arithmetic um, difficulties or, or maths difficulties now, um, we're talking about that sort of representation um, of, of number and having basic difficulties in, in representing numbers. Um, we're talking about storage and retrieval, so things like number bonds, tables, actually accessing that information quite quickly, and, and also around the um, working memory difficulties, um, sort of coordinating, sequencing, um, having control to actually um, work with these, and the sort of short-term short memory difficulties um, that we've been talking about. So it's about fact storage and retrieval. It's about working memory, but it's also about speed. Sometimes it's not that they can't do it, but it's that they can't do it quickly enough. Okay. Um, lots of people ask me about dyscalculia, and there's still a lot of research being done around um, dyscalculia. And um, so I just thought we'd just spend a couple of months talking about that. The National Numeracy Strategy definition of dyscalculia is, dyscalculia is a condition that affects the ability to acquire arithmetical skills. Dyscalculic learners may have difficulty understanding simple number concepts, lack an intuitive grasp of numbers, and have problems learning number facts and procedures. Even if they produce a correct answer or use a correct method, they may do so mechanically and without confidence. So really, it's about the ability to acquire the skills for arithmetic. That's the key. It's about the capacity to acquire the skills, not whether the skills have been acquired. Therefore, it's the understanding of number concepts and that intuitive grasp of numbers that are sort of central to this. Um, and obviously, it's, there's issues around confidence um, as well. Brian Butterworth, who's done a lot of uh, research in this area, um, he says that true dyscalculia has to be founded in understanding conceptually, not recall on arithmetical skills tests, although they play a part. And he says that true dyscalculia, as opposed to dyslexia-related maths weakness, is very rare. It's rather like people describing themselves as tone deaf, which again, extremely rare, when they, what they actually mean is difficulty singing in tune. Okay, so we're going to think a little bit now about um, some of the other co-occurring difficulties um, around ADHD and dyspraxia. And we need to think while we're talking about these, it's about assessing the impact on learning and behavior. It's how they relate to these sort of core processing difficulties, but it's the impact that they have. Excuse me, just have a sip of water. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, ADHD. <clears throat> there are many definitions um, of ADHD, um, but in the sort of the, the formal diagnosis, um, they talk about um, ADD and ADHD. Um, nowadays, we tend to use ADHD to encompass both of those. 
um, and it's described as, as a behavioural syndrome characterised by, um, by these areas, impulsiveness, restlessness, hyperactivity, inattentiveness. So um, if they have these kinds of difficulties, it may prevent them from learning and socialising um, well. And it talks about there being um, ADHD divide, being divided into attention, inattention, sorry, and hyperactivity. So people with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, um, will have difficulty suppressing their impulses and they respond to more cues than the uh, sort of average person. So in a way, rather than failing to pay attention, they pay attention to everything. So that means that they're often overloaded with information that they can't filter out. Um, and sometimes they're unable to stop and to think about a situation, to apply the brakes, if you like, and to consider the consequences uh, before they act. Um, now remember, all of these things are on that sort of continuum from severe to very mild. Um, behavior and inhibition and that interference control functions within the brain are crucial to normal behavior. They allow us to have that delay in responding so that we can think before we act. Um, and the research says that it's the degradation of these functions which typifies the outcomes of ADHD. Um, I heard another colleague talk about ADHD and he was saying that they have a very low threshold of boredom. They need stimulus all the time. So when working with them, we either have to distract them into learning or reduce the distractions so that they can learn. Okay. He said most of us get through school okay because actually we can tolerate being bored. So. <clears throat> Thinking about those two, two areas, um, just quickly looking at the inattention one, um, because we've got lots of things to, to, to go, um, go through yet. Um, so it's about uh, failing to give close attention to details, careless work, difficulty sustaining attention, doesn't seem to listen, um, doesn't follow through on instructions, and so on. Um, difficulty organizing tasks and activities. Um, reluctant to engage in tasks that um, are going to require sustained mental effort, loses things, easily distracted, often forgetful in daily activities. And for hyperactivity, often fidgets with hands or feet, squirms in seat, leaving seat in the classroom, um, just sort of running about, climbing, just actually behaving in what might be an inappropriate way in sometimes because they cannot sit still, they cannot uh, focus in that way. Difficulty playing or engaging in le leisure activities um, quietly. On the go, driven by a motor, talks impulsively, excessively, blurts out answers, um, difficulty waiting turn, interrupting and so on. All of these are things that we associate um, with that sort of um, hyperactivity. So, for, um, for ADHD, it's, it's clear that like dyslexia, there are brain differences involved. Um, we sort of have got used to thinking about left-right right, left, right brain distinctions, but um, I was talking to, and, and these are slides that um, from my colleague Dr. John Rapp, talking about the different, um, about the brain in terms of the different lobes of the brain. Um, so working from the back of the head, we've got the occipital lobe, um, which is usually uh, the part of the baby's head that's de delivered first, and then onto the temporal lobe on the side, which um, is involved in language and speech. We have the parietal lobe, which is involved in sequences and integration, through to the frontal lobe, which is called the frontal or prefrontal cortex. And that's where the kind of higher order intellectual processes are thought to take place. Those higher order processes are often called executive functions. Um, and it's that region that there appear to be the differences uh, in the ADHD. So, that um, prefrontal cortex is involved in, in planning, in decision making, in attention, 
attention control and that sort of inhibition of uh, inappropriate uh, development. So inappropriate behavior. It's reminding you again about that um, continuum from uh, sort of very mild to strong. And in this case, it's about getting that sort of balance between inattention um, and hyperactivity. Um, sometimes people say, but, but they can control attention. They may become quite absorbed in computer games and look as though they're concentrating. Um, but you know, they can become absorbed in some areas um, for some things. But we must also remember that um, these things are genetic and will often run in families too. Again, talking about the executive functioning skills, that um, we need these skills for learning new skills, um, but less so for maintaining well-practiced skills. If we think about something like learning to drive, then when it's very new to us, um, you know, we really have to think very carefully about what we're doing. But when we've been driving for a period of time, then these things become automatic. Okay, another little task for you to do. I want you to write down as many animals as you can. This is where you need your pen and paper. Okay? I'm going to give you one minute, again, write down as many animals as you can. Off you go. Okay, so how did you plan that? That was that sort of executive function. Did you think about them in alphabetical order? Did you think about them in different categories? Or were you just random? Did you jump about from one category to another? Or did you sort of get locked into um, one set, getting more and more detailed? That inability to switch sets from one way of thinking to another is thought to be characteristic of people that have got, a ten, uh, have got um, autistic spectrum uh, disorders. They, get, um, they have poor executive control. They find it difficult to sort of disengage, to move from one thing to another. Um, they find it difficult to plan tasks, to organize ahead, to switch tasks. We talk about perseveration, going on and on and on about one particular thing. Um, and find it difficult to sort of generate um, novel responses. So they much prefer rigid routines and can be quite resistant um, to change. Um, it's interesting that we now know that development of the frontal lobes goes on for much longer than was first thought. Um, and perhaps that gives us some hope to those of us who've got um, teenage boys, actually, because the, um, it increases with, with age. Um, the pattern is different for boys and girls. Boys, actually, um, their frontal lobe mature later, um, but then have, they have a sharper rise in that. So. Um, sorry if you think there's too many brain things here, but <laughs> we, you know, we know that it is based in, in, in brain, and I think it's important that we, we sort of understand and we can see how these things um, do overlap. We, we know that the brain's divided into the um, right and left hemisphere, and they each have those sort of specialist functions. Um, and when we think about developmental coordination disorder, um, because normally the, 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 the functions are shared, um, but both sides need to compete um, to complete the picture. The left hemisphere actually receives the information, but it comes in um, in a sort of a jumbled, disjointed way. Um, 
and it's the right hemisphere that works in harmony with the left where everything's sorted out, working with images, actions, etc. Um, and so people who have got dyslexic difficulties do not seem to have both hemispheres working in a sort of a, a coordinated way. If we think about a little um, exercise here that I would normally do with people in front of me, um, but you'll just have to imagine this. Um, if we think that this is a simple way of showing that sort of immaturity um, or, or, or neuronal development. If we think about the brain um, as passing simplistically, as passing messages from one neuron to the next. If you imagine that we've got a ball and three people, and we've got two people facing each other, so we've got these people uh, facing each other, um, and then we've got a third person uh, at some point in the triangle. If we imagine that these two people facing each other throw the ball to each other, right? and that's how a message is normally passed directly along its shortest route. But if the ball was thrown from one um, to the one um, in the third person, the blue line, then we have a simplistic representation of the passing of messages in the dyslexic, dyspraxic brain. The message may not go the shortest route. There's also the area in the brain known as the limbic system, and that's important. That's responsible for that sort of instinctive and, uh, and automatic response uh, within the body, and that's linked to emotional behavior as well. Um, as the brain matures, it dampens down the effect of the limbic system's emotional responses. If it wasn't the case, then people would be very ex uh, highly excitable, over-emotional, and extraordinarily uh, sensitive to sensory inputs, to sounds, to touch. And this is often seen in children who have got um, dyspraxic difficulties. And the sort of the, the warning signs in children for, um, uh, for DCD. Um, there may be um, a history, a, um, a lateness in reaching developmental milestones like walking. Poor motor, fine motor control, handwriting, fastening buttons, using a knife and fork, etc. And also the, so the um, gross motor coordination skills, difficulty riding a bike, skipping, hand-eye coordination, etc. There may be speech and language difficulties, so unclear speech, poor pronunciation. They may be poor at, um, at sports and creative skills like drawing and crafts, and there may be a delay in establishing laterality um, and or problems crossing the midline. Spatial difficulties, bumping into objects, not liking to do, dis uh, to do uh, jigsaws, getting overexcited about things, oversensitive to sound like taste, touch, and so on. Organizational difficulties, motor planning difficulties, um, auditory visual short-term working memory difficulties, um, tracking, moving an object smoothly with the eyes without moving the head excessively. Um, all of these things, um, you know, some of these things that we talk about within dyslexia as well as dyspraxia. Um, but we tend to associate um, difficulties with spatial awareness about bumping into things, tripping over things, um, but as I said before, the sensory difficulties as well. Motor planning and memory. Motor planning is how we plan routes and activities and is often difficult for the dyspraxic individual. So as with dyslexia, people with dyspraxia can have the same type of memory difficulties, uh, for, particularly for a series of instructions, etc. So, consequential difficulties. Um, so we can see that they may, might be consequential difficulties in all the specific learning difficulties we've considered. So around personal organization, um, self-esteem can but do not always see, um, see that. Um, it arises because of the children's experience of the impact of the specific learning difficulties and also of others' reactions to their difficulties. Um, Dr. John Rat was telling me um, about some studies that were done in uh, Australia um, about resilience, and they found that people who um, tended to cope better if they were given an explanation, um, that if they were, were told what the difficulty 
was why they were experiencing that difficulty, uh, they could begin to see what they could do about it. Um, so, you know, labels can be important. My son uh, was um, assessed as being dyslexic when he was um, eight years old. And one of the things that he, he said straight after was he said to the psychologist, well, am I dyslexic or not? And when the psychologist said, yes, you are, he said, I just needed to know. Thank you. And he did need to know because he needed to know that there was a name for the kind of thing that he was experiencing difficulty with. Um, so that was important to him. So they are important, but we shouldn't get too tangled up with them. We should always think about the needs of the child and bear in mind that there could be co-occurring difficulties there as well. So we need to look at the child. We need to think about the different difficulties. We need to think about the consequences, the impact on literacy and numeracy and on social and emotional. Um, and we need to think about their compensatory skills. How are they coping? And so we've got this sort of um, uh, looking at monitoring um, the, uh, the impact of interventions, setting targets. And so I'm aware time is, is moving on. Um, so I want to end, um, go, go towards the end with going back to Hume and Snowling again. For each disorder, we have quite an extensive understanding of its characteristics and the likely risk factors that lead to its development. Such understanding in turn helps to inform diagnosis and treatment. However, it's also probably fair to say that current theories and methods are in a state of flux. We've still got a long way to go. But it is clear that in developmental disorders, highly modular deficits are relatively rare and often children show complex patterns of co-occurring of impairments. Developmental cognitive disorders are certainly less independent than we or many others had hoped or expected them to be. So, to end up with what works. I went back to an Ofsted report from a year or so ago uh, where they said that the best learning occurred in all types of provision when teachers or other lead adults had a thorough and detailed knowledge of the children and young people a thorough knowledge and understanding of teaching and learning strategies and techniques, as well as the subject or areas of learning being taught, and a sound understanding of child development and how different learning difficulties and disabilities influence this. We need to look at the child. We need to consider that there may be some co-occurring difficulties, that we can't just put one label on them. We need to think about the child and their individual needs. Um, I'm going to whiz past that one because I think um, on this one, when children and young people's learning was least successful, and if we sort of relate back to what we said before, if we look at um, this, communication was poor, teachers spent too much time talking, explanations were confusing, feedback was inconsistent, language is too complex for children and young people to understand. Tone, body language, confusing. Um, and resources were poor with too little thought having been given to their selection and use. Children and young people had little engagement in what they were learning, usually as a result of these. And um, the chapter concluding observations from the Rose Review um, here, um, I'll not read it all, but at the bottom it says, it cannot be stressed enough that individuals differ in the extent to which they have co-occurring difficulties and in the extent to which their core dyslexic um, difficulties impact on learning. So, what do we need to do? Within our practice, um, we need to make sure that we have, um, we, we help children to learn to attend, um, that they may need explicit teaching and rehearsal of skills around attention and listening. We need to prepare them for learning. We need to help them with planning and organizational skills, um, give them explicit strategies. 
Um, we need to help them with that sequencing because we said just how, how important um, sequencing activities, that working memory and the impact it has on planning an organisation as well as reading and spelling as being sequencing activities. Um, we need to give them structure and we need to think about metacognition. <clears throat> now, metacognition that's the term we use for the understanding of your own learning style and processes. Um, and as teachers, I think our aim must be to help our pupils towards that. So pupils, and I think we as teachers, um, ought, ought to be able to do this. We have to know the purpose. We have to think, why am I doing this? Do I know what the objectives are for this lesson? What are the outcomes? What's the required end product? And do I know what a good example of this would look like? What is it you're actually asking me to do? Where should I be aiming with this? And what strategy should I use? Do I know which strategies can help me to do this? Have I done this kind of activity before? Did it work? Should I be changing it? Can I use the same thing again? Um, monitoring, was it successful? Did I meet the learning objectives for this lesson? If I didn't, what could I do? to actually achieve that next time? How can I improve it? Could I have done it better? How could I have done it better? What other information do I need to make it better? And also, can what I've done now be transferred to another school? What, what have I learned from this lesson that I could use in another subject or situation? We all need to think about that and we need to show our learners how to achieve that as well. We need to think about um, the, the sort of the higher order skills um, and that you know to become fluent in something is based on competence and confidence. We might need to show them how to study, how to approach tasks. Um, and also, we need to be able to show them how they can compensate for slow processing so that there might be other ways of recording things, um, using diagrams, mind maps, use of a scribe, using ICT, lots and lots of different ways. So we, we give things in a multisensory way, but we also give the learners opportunities to use multisensory ways of delivering information back to us to show that they know. Oops, right? Um, so, if we go back to the slide that we had right at the beginning when we talked about what do we mean by well-founded intervention, all of these things that we talked about need to be taken into account when we're working with children with any of those specific learning difficulties. As you've seen from the kind of working memory problems we've talked about, that this is what they need. So, no matter what the label might be, remember the chances are that if they've got dyslexia they're going to have some dyspraxic type difficulties as well. Um, you know, that there will be reading difficulties and so on, that all these things overlap. So what can we do in the classroom? Well, we can do what's there on that screen. We can make sure that we give them well-founded intervention. And so, to finish, Sorry, it's a few minutes over, but um, it is over to you now. As I said, that was a real whistle-stop tour um, through co-occurring difficulties. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, we will be actually um, delivering a, a, a continuing professional development to CPD unit on co-occurring difficulties later on this year. It's a part of um, one of the courses that we're running um, the international course, um, but we you know we will be um, putting that course up as well. So if you're interested and want to know more about that, then you might consider looking at that later on. Um, but you know, consider your current practice. Is it related to this research that I've you know given you a very very brief overview? But you can find out more um, on the internet by looking at articles, by reading um, the book that I pointed out to you, um, the, uh, the book from um, Charles Hume and Maggie Snowling. Think about what you're going to take away from this session. Is there anything you need to do to change your practice and how will you do it? Okay. 
I don't know if you've got much time for, for um, questions, Cherry. Um, um, we have got quite a few, okay, so there, no. I oh, sorry, I muted myself. Sorry. Um, no, um, we have got quite a few, <laughs> so it, it, you can carry on if you like, Elise. Um, but we, I think the best thing is is to email everybody um, with all the queries. Yes, I think so. If if you, uh, we, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can, um, and we'll get those answers out to you um, by by email. Um, I'm just sort of whizzing through and seeing if there's anything that I can see, but um, you know there are quite a few questions. Some are quite specific, um, and others. Um, we we have recorded this uh, webinar, uh, and it will be back up on our website for you to view again um, if you wish. I'm not quite certain when Cherry might be able to answer that. Um, uh, yeah, it probably will be next week now. So, um, but if you go onto our main website and there's an, an area, I think I have pumped it up on the questions, which I hope everybody has managed to see. Okay. Um, but you. yes, if you if you look in the events tab and then there's a recorded online events um, section, and they're all they're all all the past and present and future recordings will be put there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Cherry. So thank you all for listening. Um, I hope that you feel you've got something um, out of the session anyway, and um, and hopefully we'll see you again, uh, or um, you'll hear us again uh, on the public webinars in the future. So thank you very much. <laughs>